40% of Americans are quitting their job. Should you? It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, I am super excited about this show because I think we're going to be able to weigh into something that's pretty popular, pretty common out there, because there's a lot of things happening. And what I hope we're able to do is either provide folks with some guidance on how to make a very big decision well, or potentially avoid making a huge mistake if they haven't thought it all the way through. Well, when I hear a stat, by the way, this is a shock and awe type stat when you hear 40% Mm -hmm. of Americans are changing their job. By the way, that's the glass half empty. Yep. I want to tell you, there's another side to this equation that we're about to discuss. But when I see 40%, I'm like, wait a minute. How many employees we have? I know. I was thinking thinking the same. That's almost half. Our, our, our close to half our folks looking for jobs now. I walked around this morning trying to get feel better about that. Brienne did not make me feel Brienne better, is- but, but I think I think that, I think it's all okay. But it's um it is one of those things. And but here's what the reality of this situation. And we and we have Daniel put together a nice chart of this. If you want to know how many people are actually quitting their jobs, you can see we have spiked up, but we went way down because of the pandemic. I think everybody was in lockdown mode, literally with their life, but also with their careers and jobs, because we just you know, didn't know what mm-hmm. was going to happen. But now we are at a point, and here's the glass half full. There are 9.2 million jobs that are available. So that th- this is a, an opportunity for folks that people are leaving because this is the chance that there's so many jobs available Yeah, that's, right I was now. just going to clarify. If you're out there just listening, we have a chart that shows really uh, since 2000 all the way through 2020, it shows the number of jobs available and then the quit rate seasonally adjusted. And it is interesting, just like you said, is it seems like when there are a lot of jobs available and the economy seems to be doing well, there are a lot of folks quitting. There are a lot of folks leaving jobs or changing jobs. And you're right. Right now, we are at the near all-time high of 9.2 million jobs available in the country right now. So the, the, the negative stat is that 40% of people are considering leaving their job, but the positive is, is that there are tons of opportunities mm-hmm. out there. And I want to make sure I put together the put forward the optimistic glass half full take on this. And, and this is this is the article that's kind of driving. I mean, this is all over social media. This is all over commentary. Everybody talking about this 40% considering we wanted to kind of figure out, should you look at this? Mm-hmm. And, and and then also give you perspective of why is this the case? Yeah, I think it's really unique. I think that there are some very specific reasons why this is happening right now. Uh, and I think the number one reason probably is not going to be a surprise to anyone. It's probably pretty common sense. As we came through 2020, as we went through sort of a global shutdown, as we went through the pandemic, it sort of caused a recalibration moment yeah. for a lot of folks. Uh, often, you know, all through my life, I've had negative events that have actually created positive side effects. And, and, and I don't, I'm not minimizing what we all have gone through in 2020, but I do think I'm always looking for the the bright side or silver lining or turning lemons into lemonade. And I think this is one of those things where we all came through this tough period of time mm-hmm. And it is an opportunity to figure out, hey, is this a reset of something that could impact me? Because I think that's what a lot of you guys, you're in your career and the pandemic hits you. You're working from home. You're working remotely. You're you're figuring out very quickly, what did you like about your job? What do you dislike about Mm -hmm. your job? And then you're like, hey, this is the time maybe I can move to a different part of the country. I can move to a different job. I mean, all these things hit and it allowed a recalibration because you were allowed to ask yourself, Am I happy? Mm -hmm. Is this what I'm meant to do on this planet? And I think that reset and that reflection is what really puts a lot of weight of why we're having a lot of people consider this. And I think, you know, it's so common for most of us. We get so busy in our day to day that we just kind of start, we wake up, we do the thing, we rinse, repeat, we do it over and over and over again. Sometimes we don't even realize how maybe unhappy we are or maybe how things are negatively impacting us. One of the things I feel like I've heard the most over and over are folks who had a long commute in major metropolitan areas and, you know, Nashville, Atlanta, so on and so forth. Well, then the COVID thing happened and there was the shutdown. They all started working from home and they recognized that there was an hour, two hours in their day that they were no longer commuting. And we've heard them say, I don't ever want to go back to that. I mean, I, I didn't notice how much I disliked that until it was gone. 
And now I'm trying to figure out, okay, is there something I can do about there? Some way I can impact that, some way I can change my circumstance. I think folks recognize that in a number of different areas through the pandemic. So before you quit though, this is the thing, because we <laughs> this is a personal finance show. We are showing you the power of planning. I want to we want to help you figure out the why mm-hmm. and the how to make sure that this is appropriate for you because I don't want you jumping off the bridge or jumping off into a new opportunity just because all your peers and everybody else is because just because a large group are doing something doesn't mean that it's well thought out. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen a, that we, a lot of people work in mass not for their own self-interest in a lot of ways. I mean, think about credit card debt. Close to mm-hmm. half the population doesn't pay it off monthly. These things are horrible. So I'm just telling you, this is something to pay attention to. And don't leave just because you feel like your day-to-day functions are hard mm-hmm. and you're not living your your dream. And that's because I think that there's a lot of steps that you need to, to go through before you make that cut. Yeah, I think sometimes that's okay, right? Like sometimes it's okay if every single day is not our dream day, because ultimately what you hope is those days that you have to put in are working towards whatever that may be. I worry that the pandemic caused a quick reset where people are saying, oh, no, no, I got to I got to change something and I got to make an immediate rash decision. So we want to kind of walk you through before you make that decision, what are some questions you should ask before you make the decision to jump ship? Yeah, I mean, it, look, and I'm, I, I hate the glass half empty, but I think it's powerful to go deeper and explore what makes you unhappy. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I would ask people is, what are the pain points with your current job? Let's actually do a deeper dive into what is making you so unhappy. Now, would you agree, Brian, that every job, every vocation, every job that you've ever had, there are probably things about that job that you did not like. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, of course. There's, not, there's never been a perfect, other than uh, being on the Money Guy show, there's never been a job <laughs> that you just loved every single part about it, right? That's just a natural cause of being in the workforce. It's going to be something... But some of those pain points are much more severe, and some of those pain points are much more minor. Wouldn't you agree with that? I do, but I think you also need to be take it out of the conceptual and actually put it on paper. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I want you to actually, you know, maybe it's the accountant in me that I'm always doing T-charts where I'm taking the positives and the negatives. I want you to write down, so is it low pay? Is it the lack of flexibility? You don't have any chemistry or you don't like your coworkers? Mm-hmm. Actually, Go deep with why do you dislike your current work experience, and then that can lead to doing a happiness check. And and this is an important part, because I do want you to have a path forward, to have fulfillment, to have happiness, because I don't want you doing something for 20, 30 years that you just a drudge and and just not fun, but you have to be very methodical or well thought out with your planning. You've told me, Brian, in your past, there have been times where you've had jobs where like on Sunday night, you just be chewing your fingernails. You would just be like, man, the weekend went by too fast and I'm about to get into this week again and I just don't want to do that. And I think you said then that was your sign that, man, something ought to change. You, when you did your happiness check, you recognized, man, uh, it, it was more of an unhappiness check. How bad is it on Sunday night before I go back into the workforce? That was a sign that something might ought to change in your life. Yeah, now I do think there are big macro indicators like that. Chewing my fingernails to to the point of being super stressed mm-hmm. out, you know, having hard bosses, things like that. Those are things that maybe you can't fix, and this is the perfect opportunity, but you need to at least document what those things are so then you can move to the next question to make sure you're not making a rash decision. And that next question is, what are you leaving behind? Yeah, I think this is one. So often we get caught in the the grass being greener on the next thing, the grass, uh, the next opportunity being better, the next thing being better, not recognizing all the stuff that you've brought along with you, experience in a specific career field, a degree that aligns very well with one, certifications that you've earned over the years. It's a big charge to say, you know what, I'm just going to walk away from all that and go do something else. You really need to understand Uh, You spent a career or part of a career becoming an expert there just to shift into something totally new might not be as smooth or as seamless as you think. Well, I always, because we, look, I I love how Abound Wealth has formed. Mm -hmm. We we have all kind of associates and planners and others that have come from other working careers. We have doctors. We have actually an MD that's a financial planner. We have, um, you know, musicians, producers, you know, from the music industry, engineers. I mean, all these things. But every one of those people that made those big jumps and those big career changes, they did walk away 
from a lot of other stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think before you leave behind to start a new fresh thing, because sometimes the shiny side, we always hear the, gr- the grass is not always as green mm-hmm. on the other side of the fence as you think. You know, and that's, I, I want you to be reflective, not only be optimistic about what you're going to, but be realistic and honest with yourself about what you're leaving behind. And then I think before you even make the decision, oh, I'm going to shift, I'm going to quit, I'm going to leave, I'm going to go somewhere else. Are there opportunities right where you currently are? Yeah. Are there opportunities? Maybe you work with a big organization and you don't like what you're doing in your present job. You may not have to quit and go find a new company to work for. There may be shifts inside of the organization that might be a lot more streamlined, a lot easier to step into than having to do a full-on job change. Well, and I think that ties into the next question mm-hmm. is, is the timing right? Because this is something, and, and look, I've... I'm not as young as I once was, but I still remember what it was like to be in my first five years of work. Yeah. And why do I mention the first five years of work? As you guys know, we subscribe to the concept of 10,000 hours to become a master of whatever you're trying to accomplish. You said something the other day. We are quickly approaching our five-year mark of YouTube. That's right. So, I mean, yep. we, and I do feel like it has taken a while to learn this, but we have... Over 10 years before that, you know, because we started in 2006 of broadcasting, all of that worked. But it's the same thing with me becoming a, an accountant, a CPA, a financial planner. I had to put the time in mm-hmm. to develop mastery before I actually had a marketable skill that was worth something somewhere else. And I do worry when I talk about is the timing right, just because you're unhappy right now, make sure you have a long term mm-hmm. mindset because there are some things that you have to put your time in just enough to get the mastery before it gets a lot better. There's whole careers Mm -hmm. which are built on essentially breaking through, you know, making people put the time in. I'm trying, it sounds so negative to say it, but it it is, there is something about paying your dues. Yeah, I I don't disagree at all. And I feel like uh, it's unfortunate. I feel like that uh, whether it's the media or social media, whatever it is, It has created this thing, hey, you should start living your best life right now. You should start living your best life right now. And while there are glimmers of truth in that, there is something to be said about, you know, early on, you might have to do the things you don't want to do. You may have to learn the skills that you don't necessarily want to learn. Every single day that you wake up and go to work might not be your best day. If you've been at a job and you just got out of college, you've been at a job for six months and you're like, oh man, I don't like this. I'm going to go start my own thing. I'm going to go start my own business. Perhaps you have not put in the time to be able to make that assessment well. Make sure you know before you do make that jump that the timing for what you've done up to this point substantiates you making the choice to leave what you're currently doing. And there's examples of this. I think about like doctors. What what do they do with doctors? They make them go through a residency yep. where they they work them a gazillion hours. You know, they're, they're kind of throwing them out there into it. I think about even my beginning CPA years. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first few tax seasons. Um, it's just a I, slog, I, right? I mean, they did comp time back then, which I think is somewhat illegal now. But, you know, you build up so much time that it would get to the end of the year where you'd have just weeks and weeks and they weeks say, of don't time. Come to they, work. Or they would, you know, during the holidays, they tell you, don't come this week or we'll pay you out. But it's, it's one of those things where you are worked like that. Investment uh-huh. banking's the same way. There's all kind of different professions that there is going to be a grind and you need to ask yourself am i in the grind and i and if i just can defer my gratification for two years three years there's the big mm-hmm. beautiful thing i'm trying to get to that just needs to be you need to be aware of that yep. and I'm, I'm not trying to because what I, I what breaks my heart is when somebody's put four years into something and they're so close to to crossing a threshold mm-hmm but they leave right, right before the, the big break. That, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, it's back to if you're chewing your fingernails and you don't see an optimistic path forward, that's something completely different. But I do want to make sure in this new instant gratification society we live in that you are being realistic about what the long-term perspective for this career is. And now, another thing that you have to think about too, especially if you're thinking about quitting and starting something new or potentially if you're starting your own thing, is that potentially it could be an expensive decision. When we look at this, if you look at the median income by age, starting uh, in the teens all the way out to age 60, it's sort of this trajectory where as time moves along, as you get older, as you gain more uh, more experience, 
the median income tends to increase. Well, if you're someone who's in your late 20s or early 30s and you're making the decision to leave a specific industry that you've been in for the last five, six, seven, 10 years or leave a company you've been with and you've put that time in, you may be leaving right before you're starting to hit some of your peak earning years. Now, that's certainly not a reason to stay and be miserable and be unhappy, but it's certainly something you want to think about as you make that decision on whether or not the timing is right. Yeah, and that's what I also, based upon what I'm seeing here, what's going on in your personal life? Mm -hmm. I mean, because, guys, I'll tell you, it was much easier for me to start my first endeavor in my 20s than if I'd have deferred that out until my 40s yep. or some other time. Because, I mean, once you have you know, a spouse, you have children, other things. I mean, your your world, your whole outlook of life is different. So you do need to kind of take all those things into consideration to make sure the timing's right. But, and, and also don't find yourself, it's so easy in this new social media driven world where we look at what we want, but we don't see the journey that got there. That's like, right. I mean, because here's an example. I was talking, I was talking to somebody and they were talking about Graham Stephan. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about how great his life is, living out in Las Vegas, having all this money coming um, his way. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that you, you, if you go back and look at those first two years of the grind. Or, or, grind. Or, I yeah. mean, it, there's a lot of work going on behind in the background that you don't see. Mm -hmm. I mean, even who's the who's the social media guy that gives away a gazillion dollars and does all the shopping? Uh, Mr. Beast, I Mr. think. Mr. Beast is the same way. Go yep. look at, go pull his videos. Go to the oldest first. You'll see he was trying to find his yeah, voice was, during all that. It was yep. not the yep. easy stuff that we all perceive now. It's the same thing with entrepreneurship. It's the same thing. I think a lot of people think they're just going to walk through this threshold and it's going to be laid out. There's usually a lot of grind that goes into success. So, okay, so you have to answer the question, is the timing right? Uh, the other question you have to answer, and I think this is one that often gets overlooked, and, and I think it gets overlooked because this becomes an emotional decision instead of a well-thought-out decision, is are you financially stable? Have you taken the steps necessary to give you the flexibility to make a transition well? This is when I sound like a dad, and I, I'll just go ahead and own it, is that um, because I think so much in society right now says if you have the passion, if you have the talent, go pursue your dreams. And I'm like, those are powerful because look, to go, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur that's had many successful things. I've also had a few things that didn't work out, but sure. here's what I recognize that while we're successful versus others that have failed is that yes, I had passion. Yes, I had talent, but I took and saved a lot of money <laughs> to make sure I had enough bridge money or liquidity money to get me to the other side to reach success. And I think a lot of people will skip that step. They think the talent and the passion is all they need to be successful. And the reality is probably going to take you three years to build mm -hmm. something really good or to replace what you left. And that's the part that I think people overlook because that's the unsexy part. That's the part where I have to tell somebody, hey, make sure you build up not just three to six months of cash reserves. If you're leaving to go start a new endeavor or to do something that's 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 potentially risky, you better have extra cushion. You need a boosted cash reserves that, that's much higher than normal because you need bridge money. And because and most often things don't go the exact way that we always think they're going to go. And if you are going to make a big shift, whether it's starting your own business, moving into an entrepreneurial endeavor, or even changing industries, you have an idea of how that might go, but you don't know. There might be some unknown, unknown, some unforeseen circumstances. It may be a harder road than you thought. Well, if you don't have that financial stability, it is going to make it that much more difficult to stay the course. One of the questions we always ask career changers with us is say, hey, you know, there's a chance if you're going to change career and come work with us, there's a chance there's going to be a pay cut associated with that. What kind of planning have you been doing for you and your family to prepare for that? Because that's one of the things you want to see is that someone understands, yeah, I might have to take two or three steps back in order to take four or five steps forward. If you do that well, you're going to give yourself that future staying power if things don't go the exact way that you planned. Yeah, and I see this. Here's something else that I, I would I would encourage people. And this kind of, this fits not only are you financially stable, but is the timing right? Guys, if you're like, let's talk about, let's break it down into short term. If within a year, do you have a bonus structure? Mm -hmm. Don't leave in October, November, if you know you have a year end bonus yeah. in December. Don't leave in the year that you're, you know, if you stayed an extra six months, you would vest, vest completely yep. in, a, in a pension plan or retirement plan. 
I, I find so often that I think people aren't taking into account all those different financial variables because they're going with the feel good, mm-hmm. passion, talent, and there's just more to it. This is you guys are financial mutants, so you understand there's some analytics that also need to be respected in this process. And then the other thing you have to do if you are planning on making any change where there could be an uncertain adjustment to your income, right? So maybe your income might go down for a season or it might become more varied. Have you actually done the hard work of knowing what you and your family need to live off of? If you don't know where your money is going and what you're spending, it's gonna be very difficult to know exactly how much you need to make sure is coming in so that this change, so that this decision keeps you and your family economically viable into the future. I like, it, what's so interesting to me is we, we are financial advisors, financial planners. We get to do this for, for a living. I think about how often moving to a new career, moving to a new adventure is similar to the advice we have to give to new retirees mm-hmm. too. Is because the next question is, what will you be moving to? Because mm-hmm. I, I think the human nature, and this is why this is all interconnected, is the human nature concept is that we, we daydream about where we want to go yep. to, but we don't think about the fact of, is that really as good as we have the 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 green pasture view of. I mean, we have this big, beautiful view. And you said it earlier, there's going to probably be a few more obstacles. There's going to be some hiccups in the process. You need to, if you're going to actually get to that big blue sky opportunity, you're going to have to go ahead and do the planning on the front end so that when those hiccups, when those roadblocks, when those obstacles show up, you're prepared and then you just you drive right over it. One thing I've heard you say before, Brian, is whenever you're doing any sort of projecting or whenever you're thinking about making a big life change, whether it be retirement, whether it be changing jobs, whether it be starting a business, you should write out your three scenarios. Yeah. Uh, start with the one that you think is the most probable. Hey, I think this is what's probably going to happen. I think this is the way that it's going to go. And have that be scenario one. Well, then you want to have, okay, well, what happens if this goes horribly wrong? What's the negative scenario? What if all of my assumptions are off? What if everything I've assumed was way too aggressive and it ends in the worst case? What does that look like? What's my contingency? What's my fallback? What's my base level? And then if you want to, you can dream about, okay, what if this goes exactly the way that I want it and even better? What's the ultimate upside? And make sure that you constantly review all three of those. Don't just focus on that best case scenario and forget that that worst case scenario can still happen. And if you can make sure that no matter which one of those takes place, you're still able to stay on that path, you're going to set yourself up for long-term success. I think here's the the power of a plan is, guys, it's very powerful financially. Don't get me wrong, because then at least if you go to a negative situation, you have the resources, you have a plan to, to move forward. But also, here's another thing a plan does for you. It's going to insulate you from the emotional side effects of negative stuff to a degree is because you will have already lived or experienced this, at least on paper. And I'm going to give a a strange experience here, Bo, and the fact that we recently, now this is a little premature, but I'll go ahead and share it. We we bought a building. Oh. Um, Oh. No, but I think about it. Now, we've owned this building for two weeks. We'll we'll give more detail later. And there's already been two... Let's just call them super issues. You, you know, the superintendent of the building would be like, "Wow, so we bought this building and it's already had two issues." Yeah, the superintendent uh, was yeah. like that. <laughs> so, so, but here's what I, I've noticed: the more you experience the negative, it just seems like now, hey, if a pipe leaks, all, all right. right, you know, because I've experienced, I've, I've planned ahead, right. I, I've I've prepared. The same thing happens when you create that negative plan is that it will, it's not going to completely numb you. I'm not going to take a diminish that it's life can be scary, mm-hmm. but you at least will go into it to where you don't just throw the whole thing out because you had your first hiccup or things didn't go like you thought. If you have a plan, it will insulate you from that. So you stay consistent. So you stay motivated and you stay on the path to creating success. And, and then with most things in life, begin with the end in mind. You know, what is the end goal? This thing that you are moving to, is it a step that's ultimately allowing you to move in the direction you want to move? If your goal is, man, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not spending enough time with family and I'm working too many hours and I don't feel like I'm paid adequately maybe don't take that job that's a pay raise and is going to make you work 120% more hours because that's not ultimately moving you towards that end goal. Continue to think about, is this decision I'm making, is this thing that I'm doing getting to me where I want to be at the finish line or am I coming up with a very 
permanent solution to a very temporary problem. Yeah. And that's what, um, and that leads us to kind of the closing out of the questions before we get into how you do this effectively mm-hmm. is what benefits are non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. Now, now here's the thing is I always tell people, write down what success looks like for you. So you, you can kind of know, how do you know you've done this well? And I think a lot of people skip that step. And every business conference you'll go to, the, one of the first exercises they'll have you do is write down what your ideal customer or client looks like. They want you to go ahead and write down what are you looking to expand into But how often does that same logic expand to individuals with their jobs? I mean, because this is very important is what is your ideal job look like? What benefits does it have? I mean, has it got health insurance? Mm -hmm. Has it got a retirement plan? Write those things down. Advancement for opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's all kind of, I think opportunity for, I got those two completely (laughs) backwards distorted. but, But you see what I'm saying is that I want you, once again, Turning the dream into reality requires documentation and planning ahead, and I think people skip that. Well, I think in order to even know what benefits are non-negotiable, I think this is a great exercise for everyone. You ought to sit and write down, what are the benefits at my current job right now? And it's easy to think about, okay, well, I have health insurance, or yeah, they have a 401k plan. But really, what are the benefits? Is it a flexible work schedule? Is it the ability that, you know, if you have to be at a kid's baseball game or doctor's appointment, you have the ability to go do that? Are there things where you have a career trajectory, you know where you are today, and you know what you can work towards three, five, ten years from now? What are those current benefits? And if you leave this job, this company, this position, this opportunity, how easy can you replicate those somewhere else? Because, Brian, we talk all the time. There's a a large uh, financial institution in the state of Georgia that we help them with their retirement plan, and it is one of the most generous retirement plans we've ever seen in terms of what they do for their employees. And so every year when we do their open enrollment meeting, we remind them, hey, just so you know, your employer here treats you guys incredibly well because they do this much for your benefit. We want them to know that if they were to change jobs or move somewhere or go somewhere else, Another employer might not do that exact same thing. So make sure you have a true assessment of how good or how valuable your current circumstance is. Yeah, well, and some of those things that can see that don't have as much sexy sizzle can actually be some of the most valuable things mm-hmm. out there. And it is like a retirement plan because it's consistent. So, and that goes into income as well. There's a lot of people that I think they they under anticipate. They they see the job has potential for big commissions, mm-hmm. big, you know, big p- high opportunity of high income, versus the steady salary that's mm-hmm. coming in. Guys, there's something about something that's consistent and coming in to to allows you to plan around and know versus the 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 big bold opportunity. That there's a reason those things are big and bold is that they might have a high failure rate. Make sure that's built into your plan as well. Consistency can be incredibly valuable when it comes to building wealth and building wealth over the long term. You know, in the study done by Ramsey Solutions, they found that 80% of millionaires invested in their company 401k. So I'm going to say this a little bit differently. 80% of millionaires had access to a 401k and consistently chose to utilize that benefit and take advantage of it. So just know that there's nothing, while you might have the opportunity to go start your own thing and go have the big commissions and have the big windfalls, there's something to be said, just like you said, Brian, for stability and consistency through time, because that's a great way to build wealth. And and I think we have a unique perspective in the fact that entrepreneur type endeavors have, have worked well, but I'm also not so caught up in the process of how sexy being an entrepreneur or a risk taker or a celebrity of, you know, somebody who's got athletic powers or, you know, powers, powers. or abilities, <laughs> powers. but, but or, or musicians, <laughs> anything that can, because we've done, we've actually done the research with our annual wealth survey and tried to figure out who are clients and how did they create their wealth. And it's actually somewhat shocking how it's not through the virtuosos, it's not through the entrepreneurs, it's not through the senior executives. The lion's share, close to 70% of our clients, are because they're just savers and there's consistency once again. So that's what it goes back to. I, I'm not trying to diminish the dream because it would be very hypocritical for me to say, hey, don't go become an entrepreneur, even though that's how I have sure. had opportunity. But I do think people need to have the reality check of saying, 
That's not how most people do this. Don't let Instagram or somebody who's an influencer who has made it through that that tough blender of the first few years jade you into leaving something that might be your path to, to success as well. So, okay, so perhaps you're sitting there and you say, you know what? Uh, all right, I've done, guys, I hear you and I've done it uh, and I've done the assessment and I've answered all the questions and I have a solid answer for all the questions and now I'm ready to make a change. Yeah. Now I'm ready to make that shift. Well, the immediate next question you probably have is, all right, how do I do it? Yeah. How do I go about getting a job? What are the ways, if there are 9.2 million opportunities out there, how do I make sure that one of those opportunities is the perfect opportunity for me and how do I insert myself in there? So this is, we're shifting now to how do you get that job? Yep. So and this is this is something we know a little bit about. We not only um, hire folks, mm -hmm. um, hiring a lot of folks recently, but we've also had to go get our first few jobs. And, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, from my own experience, I was not what I call a front row sitter in college. And the fact that I didn't graduate the accounting program at Georgia with the best GPA, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that I was, you know, I, I've struggled with that my whole, I don't, my whole, my whole life, really. If you sure. look at standard, I have a daughter who's, you know, going into her senior year of high school. We're doing the whole standardized test thing. And I, and I was honest with her. I said, look, I never did great on any of the standardized sure. tests either. There is so much more to being successful than the, the, the glossy brochure of what your resume can do. And we want to help you figure out how do you stand out so that people can say, maybe you are that dyslexic weirdo like I am that needed to have some different things show through than what was just on paper. And that's why the first thing we're going to talk about is how do you peacock? How do you make yourself stand out? That's exactly right. Uh, now, look, if you are one of those front row sitters and you are the person who has the fantastic grades and like the 10,000 SAT and the 55 ACT and all these things that are wonderful, that's great. Utilize that. That's a way that you peek out. But if that's not you, you do have to find things, find ways to make yourself stand out, even if those other candidates are those front row sitters, are those folks with those grades. So you have to do some self-assessment to figure out, okay, what skill do I have or what's unique about me or what action can I take that is unique? Yeah, and there, there's several ways this plays out. The, you know, you, this could be while you're going through the interview process, make sure you're trying to find ways that you can do work that others aren't willing to do. And then staying on the peacock type thing, how do you make yourself stand out? And we actually had some experience sure. shares on this, is that like Rebe, our producer, she yeah. shared that when w one of her jobs, they had specifically mentioned that they were looking for a creative creativity, creativity in the, the application yeah. process. So she actually internalized that and said, "Hey, how can I do this process and actually show them I create I'm very creative?" And, and and she did that by going the extra mile with creating her own website. She said she with coded her, a website. Uh, coded her own website to to show her resume and all of her skill sets and all those things to show that she's willing to do work others are not willing to do and make herself stand out. Guys, that is so important that you have to be willing to stand out. And this is what her employer said. She said, hey, we had all these candidates come in. You're the only one that did this. You're the only person that built a website. You're the only person that like put this skill set forth. So it was no contest. It wasn't like we were trying to decide between you and someone else. It was you because none of the other competition did that. If you can find ways to do that. Now for you, maybe it's not coding a website. Maybe that's not the thing you do, but there are some things that no matter who you are, you can do really well. Well, I mean, my experience share also for myself was I, coming out of as an accounting major, not having, I had good grades. I don't want you guys to think that Brian was on the verge of getting kicked out of college. I was nothing like that, but I was not, like I said, the front row sitter, but I knew I was not going to be able to just rely on the grades. When I got my, my interview at the CPA firm that I really wanted to work at, I found out, I tried to search around to find out who their who their clients were, you know, look at audit reports, look at other things that are published online, and then you find out who their customers are and go see if you can go interview yep. one of their customers. That's I actually there's a hardware store in my hometown that I found out used this firm. Um, and I went and interviewed the owner of that firm and then I made sure I shared that in the interview sequence. After I'd worked there for a few years, the partner shared with me, that's why they hired me. They had never had a candidate that actually was so interested in the job that they went and qualified and interviewed a customer 
to make sure that I like the business. They said everybody's, they're interviewing people, but they never have candidates that are interviewing to make sure that it's a good fit mm -hmm. for them too. And that really stood out to them. You know, I'll share mine. Now, I hesitate to say this because we talked a little bit about this in pre-show prep, Brian. Uh, what I would say that I did unique in my interview process is I asked hard questions. Now, I'm nervous that when I say that, people are immediately going to jump to, okay, great, interview process. I'm going to start negotiating salary. We're going to talk about benefits. We're going to go back and forth. That's not what we're talking about. We'll give you some insight on that. But Brian, when I first interviewed with you many, many, many years ago, uh, it went really well. I felt like we hit it off. I felt like we had a great rapport. Uh, and then radio silence. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. A month passed, and then two months passed, and it was getting to the end of the semester. And so I just called you, and I said, hey, uh, Mr. Preston, uh, just want to touch base. I never heard back from you. Uh, I felt like we had a great interview, and I felt like we really hit it off. And man, I just got to let you know, I feel like I'm perfect for this job. I feel like I would be the best fit for this. Would you mind telling me what it was? Why, why did you not select me? And what I did is I put you on the spot where you had to either one, give me some advice about why the other guy or other girl was better, or two, give me some things I need to work on. Either way, I was going to get value from whatever feedback he gave me. And it just so turns out the feedback turned out pretty good. Well, the reality of the situation, the other side of this, guys, without going on too much of a tangent, was I'd already hired the position. It was one of my clients, one of my bigger clients' daughters needed a, <laughs> a, a job. And it was, she was a marketing. She wasn't even in the financial field. But I was like, you know what? I was having trouble getting clients at the time. What I need is a marketing person as well as an assistant sure. on it. When Bo called and he asked those hard questions, I was like, Wow. This is actually who I need. And, and, and it is amazing that Bo was able to change my trajectory on who I was hiring and even create a very complicated and hard conversation with that, that client um, that I was no longer hiring her, her daughter. And by the way, that client is still a client. Well, yep. the daughter is now a client. Yep. And, um, and she jokes about that. Every She's time she sees joke. Bo, she goes, you have my job. You're sitting at my desk. Yeah, but it's, um, it is one of those things where and, – and, but I think that that was very hard. We have um, – Marcy, any of you guys who are customers or clients of the, of, the, of the firm, you probably deal with Marcy. Marcy cold called us. Yep. Um, if you think about uh, – you know, if you look at the opportunity, go stand out, do the things other people aren't mm -hmm. willing to do, and, and it can be – be good. And that also leads to the fact that you need to be authentic in the fact that are you sending out, you know, thank you notes? Are you, because guys, have a great interview, but then don't follow up with people and that's not going to go well for you. I know that sounds old school, but it's true. As an employer, this one's so silly, but something that's like handwritten, I, I know that email is like the way that we do things these days, but every time we interview somebody and we get a handwritten note, we're like, huh, yeah, that's good. That's really, really good. You know, another thing that you can do is be authentic on your resume. Be who you actually say you are. Don't try to customize your resume for who you think the employer will want you to be. Be authentic about who you actually are and figure out how that can benefit your employer. Make sure that you are doing your research to know what it is the employer is looking for and you can make sure that you are indeed a good fit for the job that you're applying for. I think, you know, like on the, on the and I'm putting both of them together, but on the thank you letter and I don't think you can be you can do too much meaning yep. that if you want to send a thank you email but then also write a handwritten letter nobody's gonna be like oh but they already sent me an email now I got a letter too you can't do too that's much right. so don't I'd rather you overdo that because I'll tell you what that's gonna be perceived as excitement and mm -hmm. enthusiasm that is going to get you over a lot of yep. barriers whereas if maybe somebody interviewed a little bit better than you but they just came off as eh you know that you know they don't really they're they're great and talented but they don't have a lot of passion for this mm -hmm. this organization yep. this might put you over the top and you really ought to consider that as an opportunity so okay so send a thank you letter be authentic uh, write a personal cover letter again everyone kind of does cover letters you got to figure out how to make yours personal make yours unique this next one is the one i think is so exciting though. well but but the cover, cover letter even could be an email i'm just telling you be i know you were, we're moving it on but i just want to You've got to stand out here. And I know a cover letter sounds old school, so but it doesn't have to. Maybe it's email with a unique take sure. that made you show that you did more research yep. on, the, on the company. And then here's the last one. This is the one Bo's excited to, to jump right into is really, and this is more of a, a behavioral hack. Mm -hmm. And this is a superpower that if you can understand this, use the rule of reciprocation and the fact that, guys, we're – 
us humans, we have some weird coding in us in the fact that if somebody does something for you, you feel like there's a social contract that's mm-hmm. been created. Think about when you go to um, an ice cream store. What do they do? They offer you free samples. Why do they offer you free samples? Because they know as soon as you take that free sample, you're going to feel it's a social contract committed that you have to buy something from them. Guys, the same thing could happen. You could make yourself stand out. We, I have a few experience shares on this, is that we had a, a, a client that was trying to get into a, a franchise of a national brand, couldn't get anybody to return his call. So he sent a Tumblr mm-hmm. um, with the, the, the school mascot, of the college, the college that, the, that, the, that the head person he was trying to reach went to, guess what? He got a call back because yep. he sent a $25, $30 gift to this thing. I know that sounds ridiculous because obviously if you're getting your first job, sending out $30 gifts to everybody can get it's very hard, expensive, yep. but you could, you could target it. But there's nothing that says when you show up to that interview, you don't show up with some a, a plate of fancy cookies or <laughs> cookies you made yourself or you could do something mm-hmm. that simple because... I can also share. We kept a uh, an investment a little longer than we probably should have because they sent us cookies sent us every cookies year. So it was year. A creating a social contract where I was scared to fire them. The same thing happens over and over again. Use that power, guys. That's a behavioral hack mm-hmm. that you need to figure out. How do you make yourself stand out and and at least stand out in their brain where they remember you? That's it. Yep. This this could be a, a social contract could work to your benefit. Okay, so you want to learn how to peacock. Uh, here's the second thing, and this one I, I, I worry. Oh, see, I'm not an old guy, and I'm about to say something that's gonna make me sound like such an old guy. I worry about the next generation coming through because sometimes I feel like this gets a little bit lost. But excitement and enthusiasm in the interview process and the conversation process can go a very long way. Um, y'all probably have figured out to do this show and other things. I'm a people pleaser. I mean, if you want to know my what drives my wanting to be liked and making other people feel good and happy has been great for the show creation, but it's also one of those things where it makes me a little needy to get when we sit across from each other. I kind of want feedback that you're happy to be there. And I am amazed when I'm interviewing candidates sometimes where on paper they look awesome and brilliant and great. But then when you're interviewing, it's like, Man, they're kind of annoyed they had to be there. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, you, you just can sense that something's off. Or they're going through the motions. There's... Yeah, I mean, so if that is you, I'm telling you, enthusiasm or excitement, because you're thinking anybody who's interviewing you is trying to figure out, is this somebody that's going to be part of my day family that I'm going to want to work with? If you come in and seem like you have better things to do, that is going to show through yep. no matter how talented or how good you are. You need to be careful with that. Now, be careful going the other way because if it is manufactured and it's fake and it's just sopping wet with like inauthenticity. Yep. Is that the inauthentic. Word? If it's inauthentic, people are going to see that. They're going to notice that. So you have to be authentic, but it's okay to be excited about a job. It's okay to be enthusiastic about why you might be a valuable piece of this organization or this company or this person that you're interviewing with. That's a big deal. And confidence goes with this too. I I have an experienced share and Daniel had no idea because I didn't make it in the show notes. You know, when we were interviewing (laughs) Daniel, Daniel had actually graduated. He was the quarter we were interviewing for interns was the the quarter Mm -hmm. that, or semester, I'm old school, but the semester that Daniel was graduating college. And we were interviewing for interns, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking they're going back to to school after they they do a summer with us. And when we interviewed Daniel, we said, Daniel, you're graduating and... um, this you is know, an internship. This is an internship. I feel nervous about you moving here for, you know, doing a lease on an apartment, all these other things, when this is just a, a three-month commitment that we're signing up for. And I'll never forget Daniel's <laughs> response to us. And you have to know, Dan- this is not Daniel's typical personality. He's like, oh, if you guys give me this internship, you'll hire me. And, and he I was, and, and fact, he just very just matter of fact said, if you it. give me this internship, you'll hire me. So it'll be okay. <laughs> I, I don't mind signing the lease. I'll take that risk. I was just like, I guess we have to we, hire, we have to hire this guy. If he's that guy confidence in this position, well, how could we not do this? So there is something about enthusiasm, confidence, and excitement goes a very long mm-hmm. way. And I love the fact that I get to share that now post Daniel being successful with, with the whole, we made it through the internship. So that's why when y'all hear me call him full-time equivalent Daniel, 
there's a journey there. There's a story <laughs> that's actually exciting for us to kind of talk about because he talked us in, just like you talked me into hiring you, Daniel did kind of the same thing with that interview. Noticing a the theme. Noticing a the theme yep. with Brian Preston. All right, so here, here's the third one. And this one is so easy but so overlooked. Do your research. Now, for those of you out there uh, watching us, you know about the Money Guy Show. You've obviously found us. What's amazing is when we have financial advisors, financial associates from other parts of the country that come and interview to be a financial associate at our firm about wealth, we're always amazed <laughs> when they've never heard of the Money Guy Show. Oh, you guys do a podcast? That's kind of cool. We're like, come on, do your research. Look up the person you're interviewing with. So if you can do a little bit of research about either the person that you're talking to or the company that you are pursuing, it will set you apart from the crowd and let them know that you are serious and sincere about your desire to be with that organization. Well, this is a sibling of peacocking and mm -hmm. the fact that, I mean, because really these are all interconnected with each other is because if you show up at that inter interview and you've done nothing but just go to the website, mm -hmm. guys, you're not setting yourself up to show that you are going to be different than all the other candidates that are out there interviewing for the exact same job. So go out there. I mean, I'm with you. I mean, that is such a turnoff when we, because we do use uh, some recruiting firms and other things when we hire. And I'm just amazed that these these people come and they interview. They had no idea we're doing no YouTube. Idea. Had no idea. They, they, somebody ought to ask, say, Hey, you guys are growing at 35 to 40 percent a year. <laughs> what's That's, going on? What, what's going on? Just your curiosity of life and, and, and opportunity for the future. I say they obviously are doing something. Mm -hmm. It's it, so be curious when you're interviewing and make sure you know that, that you have done your research on the employer so that they can see that enthusiasm, see that you took the time because and that you're committed to this process as well. Uh, the fourth tip that we would give you is uh, when it comes to your resume or when it comes to your cover letter, when it comes to your written communication, get rid of the jargon. I, I can't tell you how many times I will be reviewing it. And look, I'm in the financial industry. I've been doing this for a while now. And I'll read somebody's resume and I'll just be like, what? Well, well, I don't even know what this just said because they tried to put a bunch of – it just – make sure it's clear. Make sure you clearly express – who you are, what you do, why you're valuable, and what your experience is. I think this goes in line of one of the reasons we're successful is that we do have a passion for what we do. So we we don't have to, since we know the material, we don't have to try to spin people's head with mm -hmm. fancy jargon and complexity to to try to get a concept across. And I feel like the same thing happens, and this is a fault this is a fallacy that I think a lot of young people will do, is especially if you're doing something that's a very specialized um career is you'll think I need to use the jargon. I need mm -hmm. to make myself seem smarter so that I can be at the level of these people I'm trying to impress and get to. The problem is guys, you haven't had the experience completely of that person that's probably interviewing you. So the reality is they can see through what you're doing and it will come off much emptier. It will seem off instead of coming off as a person that is transparent and we can th there's opportunity to mold this into a, a great asset for the team you come off as a faker yep. and that is a you just need to be careful you want to come off as the real version of yourself mm -hmm. that, that w has the opportunity to grow within this organization and that leads to number five and this is a powerful one I mean we, we saved I won't I won't say we saved the best for last because peacocking is so powerful mm -hmm. and standing out but this is one that I think is if you look at how people get jobs, their network really is powerful. And a lot of people will be like, oh, no, this is when, you know, I didn't grow up rich. I grew up poor. I don't have the network because I've done that, too. I mean, sure, both of yeah. us come from very humble beginnings. The whole reason I switched from finance to accounting is that I knew if I graduated with a finance degree, I was going to end up at a bank or a brokerage firm trying to cold call people. And I was like, I don't know anybody with money. They could even potentially be a client, so I'm not going to do that. That's not what we're talking about when I talk about networking. Remember how I told you I got my first job in public accounting? I went to a hardware store in my hometown mm -hmm. to interview that customer of the CPA firm I was trying to, to work with. So you don't have to, your network doesn't necessarily have to be your aunt, your uncle, or a neighbor down the street if you don't live, run in those circles. But you can expand your network to 
Who do you go to church yep. with? Who are businesses there in your community? There are there, There's a lot of intersections. Why do we even have this game of the separation of Kevin Bacon? Is because you probably very much in yourself are not that far removed from where you're trying to be. I'm, I'm always amazed uh, of people. Now, I, for, I don't know. I never had this issue. But I know a lot of our clients, and we have some colleagues and friends, who are almost ashamed to use their network. Perhaps your parents uh, were well-known in the community, or perhaps they had some business success and were connected. And there's this desire that, you know, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm not going to use mom and dad. I'm not going to use the help. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go my own. And I guess there's something noble about that, and I understand sort of the psyche there. But if you do have tools at your disposal, it seems crazy not to use them. You know, one of my uh, best friends uh, in the whole world, he has a son uh, who is about to be a senior in college, right? (laughs) And his son is studying accounting at a university down in Georgia, and he's thinking about financial planning. And so my buddy calls me and he's like, hey, you know, what what would you think about my son maybe doing an internship with you guys? I was like, hey, well, I want, you can't interview for him. He's got to call me and have him talk to me and we'll, we'll go through it. And so his son called me and we talked and we gave him an internship, and we've allowed him to come in and kind of see what we do and how we do things here. It was because of that personal connection that he was even able to land this internship. It might not have happened any other way had it not been for that. So use those things to your disposal. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you're going into a job interview or you're going to interview with a small business, with a business owner or whoever, and you've not at least checked, okay, do we have common friends on Facebook or LinkedIn or in, you know, fill in the social media to see what connections you have? You may be missing a huge opportunity to build a bridge that could be very, very powerful through the interview process. One of the, the things that I hate that we've gotten to a size that I can't do it as much as we used to, but I love when uh, brand new employees, like one of the first things I did with you, Bo, is we sat down and I walked you through where each client yep. came from. And, the, and I call it the spider web of relationships of, hey, this person was referred by this person who was referred by this mm-hmm. person. It's just so fun. The same thing happens professionally too. I, I think about the fact of we got Reby from uh, the producer for the show, for, for those that might be new, from the fact that um, one of our associate planners here went to church with her. Yep. And then I think about we got Nate because Reby ran in circles within the, the radio networks yep. that we were able to get Nate. I mean, there's a lot of – the networks really do help create opportunities. So so kind of – it's a culmination of everything we discussed. Don't be scared to stand out. Don't be scared to show your enthusiasm. If you want a job, make sure you tell them that. Mm-hmm. I mean, Bo and I disagreed on that a little bit because I wanted to put that in the show notes because it makes me so happy when somebody, when I'm interviewing, when they say, look, I'm excited about this. If you guys offer it to me, this is where I want to be. I Because, look, I was horrible at dating, you know, because it was one of those things where I had to have a girl practically club me over the head or literally like my wife's situation <laughs> where her best friend said, Hey, my friend thinks you're cute. You, you ought to ask, ask her, her out. out. <laughs> you know, because I am just not the type of person that picks up on all context clues. You don't know if you're the person you're interviewing might be the exact same way. That Just go ahead and let them know that this is the opportunity because a lot of people will be in their career, their, their dream job opportunity, but I think they're trying to play it cool trying to play it coy when you should probably just go ahead and be transparent. And that leads to... I saw something on social media, and, 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 and I think I have a unique perspective on this because everybody was comforting this person, is that somebody had been offered a, a really good job, and then they came back and started trying to negotiate things, and then the, the company said, no, you know what, we're just kidding. We're they just going to we're, we're rescind the offer. We're not going to do that. And then this person was lamenting on social media, and everybody was being very supportive, uh, uh, you know, and telling, well, that place must have just been jerks, horrible, and so Mm -hmm. forth. But I have a unique perspective as as the employer and the fact that you should always, and this is probably would be the sixth tip that didn't make it on here, know where you are in, 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 in this negotiation or discussion. If this is your big break, you're at the threshold, you're there, and there's a chance that you could get to do something that is a chance of a lifetime, don't screw it up with little stuff because there are so many things that I look at. What would it take? All I needed was a chance to get my foot in the door. Why do we have that saying? I just need to get my foot in the door. Yep. If you're good, 
it will work itself out. I really do believe that talent can rise and you can do that, but don't let something, because you read on a blog post somewhere that you should always ask for 20% more than what they offer you or some other number, because there's a chance they just say, you know what, there might be a hundred people that want the same job and they were going to go with you, but now they're looking at you going, man, this might be more trouble than we're, we're thinking. But, you know, so, and that's not saying you can't negotiate. I'm just saying know where you are. If there's a hundred candidates trying to get this job and you're one of the hundred, you might not have as much power as if they're, you're one in a million yourself, yep. but be re- realistic when you evaluate who you are in that process. Because if it, it, it's just something I think people need clarity on that so they don't screw up that their big shot. I, you know, I feel Eminem playing in the background. <laughs> I just don't want you to blow it. Start rapping. No, no, I mean, I'm not going to do that, but I do want people to be aware of where you are in the situation so you don't miss your shot. There, there are 9.2 million open jobs right now. So this could be a fantastic opportunity for you to make a shift, to change jobs, to adjust inside of your current job, to start that business, to fill a new void, but make sure you approach it well. Make sure you follow these steps to know that you're making the right decision for yourself, the right decision for your family, and you're doing it the right way. Because with 9.2 million open jobs and 40% of Americans quitting their job, it means there's a lot of competition out there. And just like you are a financial mutant in your personal finances, if you are changing jobs, you got to figure out how to be a job mutant, how to be a candidate mutant to insert yourself in a very real and powerful way. Uh, We're going to keep loading you up on the personal finance side. If you've not gone to our website yet, go to moneyguide.com slash resources. We have tons of free resources available for you out there. We have tax cheat sheets, uh, food deliver, financial order of operations deliverables, how powerful are your dollars worksheets. If there are things that you want to know, tools you want to use, make sure you go out to our website, moneyguide.com slash resources and check those out. Guys, thanks so much. We love that we get to bring you this content all the time. I mean, I was, you know, it's funny. We used to do the show, started off bi-weekly. Now it's just, we're coming at you all, all the, the time. time. So I, I thank you guys for going on this journey with us. Do check out those resources that Bo talked about. Subscribe, turn on the notifications because we're doing live streams. We're dropping dropping in all the time. You won't know about it unless you get in those notifications. So, so take care of us that way, and we're going to keep creating content. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out. <laughs>